All right, good evening, everyone. It is 6.30 Central Time here in the Arkansas Delta, and good Lord, is it hot outside. My goodness, how in the world are you tonight? I hope you have had a safe and a cool day uh, wherever you have been, whatever you have been doing, and if you have been outside, I am so sorry because it is miserably hot out there. The heat index well over 100 right now, and uh, whew, only, only warmer things to come. And uh, I, I am thankful for air conditioning. I am thankful for the man or the woman that, uh, that created the air conditioner today. It is so stinking hot. I mean, hot. I, I, I posted something yesterday and he came across as a joke, but I mean, let's just be real. And that was uh, the National Weather Service had issued a, a recipe on how to bake lasagna in your mailbox. And that's pretty doggone warm, folks. And it is. It is warm. Hey, when you get on, say good morning and let me know that you are here. I am in the process of doing all that extra sharing and I will ask you to do the same thing. And that is to hit the share button, put it out to your friends, your family, and tell them to say, hey, come on, tune on in, and let's talk about what's going on in the book of Exodus tonight. We're going to be wrapping up chapter 24, I think it's 24, right. We're going to wrap up 24 tonight, and then, Lord willing, we are going to go into 25. That's really where I want to get to tonight, is to get it started. And uh, it, it's, it's one of those things that it is the blueprint for the tabernacle. And it is just, oh my goodness, it's so incredible. And I can't wait to get there. And if we can't, then obviously that'll be next week. But uh, I do hope that uh, we can get at least part of the way there. Uh, I am almost ready to where I can see who is out there and what all is going on and all of that good stuff. Uh, let me see here. All right, who, Rebecca Lewis, perfect opportunity to preach a sermon on hell. Girl, that's what I'm talking about. That will preach without question. Oh my goodness, man! It is just, it is just seriously some kind of hot. I saw, uh, I saw a meme today on social media. And it, was, it was, it was quite funny, and it had the picture of the sun over here, and then right beside it was the state of Arkansas, and then right behind it was hell, and right behind it was uh, Earth. And I thought, oh, how true that really is today. Oh, it is, it is just warm, 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 warm. So uh, again, if you're here, go ahead and say good morning. Let me know who who all is uh, locked and loaded and joining me. I am almost there. Uh, man, we got uh, we got a great group of folks on here. Holy cow! Let's see, Mary Weddington. What's going on, Miss Mary? Bobby. Let me see. Give it the other direction. Bobby Aston. Good to see you, Bobby. What's going on, Johnny Smith? Johnny Smith in the house. Uh, Sandy and Jack are in here. Jesse up grow up to Grove here, hanging out with us. Miss Teresa, she is here. And Rebecca Lewis, I've already said good morning to her. Let me see here. Who all? What else? What? 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 Let me see here. Boom shakalaka. Uh, there's my buddy C.J. Looney. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. Coffee strong enough to chew. That is my soulmate right there. That is exactly what I'm talking about. Let me see here. Uh, it looks like I, uh, my, my, my daughter is on and so is my grandson. Colson is trying to show me his chip. Colson, man, if you were watching Pat Bob right now, I just want you to know something real quick. I love you more than words can ever tell you. Mm -mm -mm. I sure wish I was there with you. You be good. You take care of mom and daddy, okay? You be good. I love you bunches, Colson, man. All right. All right. Let me see here. Uh, man, man, I needed that. I need to, I, woo, need to see my kids. Uh, boom, 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 boom. I have no idea who all what. Bobby asked, I'll take a day like today over any day under 55. Well, Bobby, I would disagree with that. Uh, I have lived in the north coast of Ohio for over 10 years, and so I do understand what cold is, and 55 is not cold. Uh, 55 is actually shorts and t-shirt weather, to be absolutely honest with you. Roofer on my roof, frying. That's what Miss Jessie says. Absolutely. I can fully believe that. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Miss Judy Davis is here. What's going on, Miss Judy? What is going on, Miss Judy? Okay. Uh, Larry and Pam are here. Larry, uh, Pam, it looks like you are posting as Ridgewood tonight. So uh, just as a heads up, uh, it is hot. My air. Oh, Miss Mary, your air is out. Do you need anything? Do you need fans? Do you need anything that we can bring you to help get you cooler tonight? Do not go through this night with all of this heat, okay? You let us know right now, right right tonight, what we can do to help you because we do not want to see you go through this mess, okay? There's there's no need of it. You, you let us know. Uh, 
Uh, boom, 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 boom. What all we got? What all have we got? Trying to say and say howdy to everybody that is here, here, here. He says, oh, cute duck face. <laughs> oh, I love it. Mary's got a fan. Do you need more? Okay. If you need more, let us know. Okay. We'll take care of it. I mean, tonight. We will take care of it. Not a problem at all. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Okay, I think that's it. Hey, everybody got your Bibles turned over to Exodus 24. Go ahead and do that. What I want you to do uh, right now is uh, if you have prayer requests that you would like to share, right now would be a great, great time to go ahead and list those in the comments if you would like to do that. I know Miss Mary Weddington shared a prayer request a little earlier tonight, today, and that was about a family in Mesquite, Texas that uh, has come down with the coronavirus. And so we want to remember that family. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, Miss Mary knows them uh, quite, uh, quite personally. I do know of another person that has been in the hospital this week that was very close to the virus. They thought that this individual had it. But as of today, that was a negative result that came back and I, all I can say is praise the Lord for that. Uh, but if you have prayer requests, go ahead and list those so that we can make sure we have them listed. Also, if you have just something that you just want to say thank you Jesus about, some good news, some praise reports, then this is a good time for you to go ahead and do that. Uh, Man, let's see here. Uh, Dorothy Barnwell, Bev's mom, Dorothy Barnwell is joining us tonight. Oh, well, hello, Miss Dorothy. How are you tonight, sweet lady? So, so blessed that you are being able to hang out with us tonight. Thank you so much for doing that. I pray you've had a great day, and uh, I pray that you are able just to sit back with Bev and Dan and uh, enjoy our time together uh, as we gather here online. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, oh, I love it. I love it. Chris Frankenberger in the house. What's going on, Miss Chris? How's things in the great metropolis of Jonesboro? How's your crew? How is Keith? How's Mr. Brooks? Let us know all the things. Let us know what all's going on. Uh, okay. What all? Okay. Look, Miss Mary, you have got offers all over the place for a place to sleep. So do not stay hot tonight. Okay. You've got the offers. Put your overnight bag and get over there. Okay. Got it. Got to get cool. Okay. We definitely want to make sure that you are taken care of. Uh, all right. So, so good. Uh, again, go ahead and, uh, uh, Miss Denny, I didn't see you, baby. Good to see you, Miss Denny. Uh, glad that you are here. Glad you're hanging out with us. I pray everybody has had a smooth day. Got tonight, had a good supper, and uh, I just kicked back, ready to uh, dive deep into Scripture, because that's really what we're going to do. This is one of my favorite chapters in the book of Exodus. Uh, I love the story of how they crossed the Red Sea. I mean, don't get me wrong, and that imagery is amazing, but Woo, smokes. Boy, when uh, when we get into what God gives Moses on Mount Sinai about the construction of the temple, it is a game changer. And so when you start seeing the uh, the specifics of this, then you are really going to have your mind blown. And if you've never studied it, mm, holy smokes, it's, it's going to be great, great, great. Hi, Miss Pat. So good to see you tonight, Miss Pat. I hope all of the wedding planning for the granddaughter is going well. And I pray that there is very little stress involved, that uh, everybody is going super smooth. Today on my memories at Facebook, it popped up. Um, if you remember on Sunday, uh, I talked about a wedding that uh, uh, Denise and I had gone back to Ohio to, uh, to perform. Today is that anniversary for that couple. Uh, they are celebrating, I, I believe today's three years. Uh, and so uh, it was just good to kind of uh, reminisce and talk with them today. Uh, about that weekend, about that time. They're just special kids to me. I love them dearly. I always will. He, uh, the, the young man was one of my uh, primary team leaders uh, uh, during the campus ministry that we were there. Just a phenomenal young man. And uh, uh, love him. Love him dearly. Love his bride. And so uh, great, great, great to see uh, them and to celebrate with them again today for three years. Okay, prayer requests, praises. Go ahead and get those in so that we can uh, uh, talk about those, get them ready, get them in. Uh, remember, tomorrow morning, Miss Pat is not going to be with us. She is taking the next two Thursdays off so that she can take time with that granddaughter. And then uh, due to this, this crazy heat, we are not going to be going back outside right now with Brother Johnny. So nothing tomorrow. Uh, Extracurricular-wise, you will uh, find me uh, in the morning uh, for our coffee chat time. And then uh, other than that, that's be the only time that we will be online. So uh, we'll make your plans accordingly. Uh, let's see here. Anything else going on? Uh, 
I don't see anything being posted. So what we're going to do is we're just going to open with a word of prayer tonight. And then we're going to dive right back in. We're going to wrap up chapter 24 in the book of Exodus. And then we are going to hightail it and jump into chapter 25 with both feet. Let's pray tonight, okay? Father, what a, what a beautiful day that you have blessed us with. Lord, we know it's hot. But Father, we know that, that uh, uh, it, it's okay that you are still in control and that we know that there's a place that uh, for someone that doesn't believe in you and that has never accepted you, that is, uh, that is going to be way hotter on them at, uh, all throughout eternity. Father, tonight I just pray for the ones that are here. I pray for the ones that are watching and the ones that will watch. And Father, I pray a special blessing upon those. Father God, I ask you, Lord, that you would just open our hearts, open our minds tonight, that we can hear from you, we can see what you're trying to teach us. Lord, I do ask a special prayer tonight for this family in Mesquite that Ms. Mary Whittington has shared with us. Father, for lots of prayer requests that are here and unspoken. Father, I pray specifically, Lord, for our country. Lord, we are just in a hot mess. And Father, I just... Uh, Father, I just pray that you will just intervene. God, that you would just send revival to this country. Lord, I'm just praying for nothing short of the hand of God at work in our country. Father, we, uh, we, we believe that there's something great coming. We are anticipating it. We're excited about it. And Father, we just want to be obedient and be a part of it. Father, watch over us tonight. Protect us. And Father, we just ask you, Lord, that if we have said, done, and thought anything that is contrary to your will, Father, that you would forgive us, Lord and that you would cleanse us, Father, from all unrighteousness. Father God, I love you. Thank you so much for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, let's see, we've got, we've got one prayer request that's coming. This is from Pam. Susan De La Rosa and both her parents have COVID. Susan also has type A influenza. Whoa, whoa, okay, that's, uh, that's a hammer right there. We do want to remember that family, so make sure that you write those down on your prayer list so that you don't miss those and pray for those folks throughout the week. Okay, here we go. We're going to chapter 24, and we're going to wrap this up. We're going to be starting at verse number nine. Hmm. All right, this is, this is back up on the mountain uh, with Moses, and there's going to be a, a crew that's going to go with him. And I'm going to pick up the reading here at verse number nine, and we are going to read, let's see, how that was, wasn't that? Okay, good. There's some conversation going on. When y'all y'all get all that done, make sure that you let me know. Uh, uh, Jesse said, remember Mike. Okay, we want to remember Mike tonight, okay? Uh, put Mike down on your prayer list. Yeah, we're going to read verses 9 through 18. Here we go. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. Mm. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. Are, are, are you getting this? Can, can you picture this. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God and they ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments, which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant, Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And so Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, you got that picture in your mind? Can you see that? Okay, this is the trip that Moses and Aaron and Aaron's two sons and the 70 elders take up the mountain. Verses 9 through 11 tells us, tells us that they saw the God of Israel. 
They saw the God of Israel. These, these representatives, if you will, of, of Israel that went with Moses and his team that went up the mountain, they went up by God's instruction, okay? They, they just didn't go up on their own. They went up by God's instruction. They were privileged to, to have seen God without being consumed simply by his holiness. They were not killed at all. The precisely what they saw, really in all honesty, has got to remain almost a, a, a moot point, but we must stay with the description that we have of what they did see, which focuses. I'm, I'm going to go back up there. This is verse 10. They saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, as it was like the very heavens in its clarity. Folks, all they could see, all they could focus on was what was under the feet of God. Now you just you just just get that in your mind, okay? I want you to visualize that. Now this is this is perhaps probably a, uh, a, a like a partial manifestation of God. We we don't know, uh, you know, such such like that would occur before Moses in chapter thirty three verse twenty, but it is most probable that the elders here in the presence of God, in the presence of this divine majesty and beauty and strength. They did not dare to raise their eyes above the footstool. They were just so, just in awestruck that their eyes could not get any further. Now you think about that. What if you were on that mountain and that was you? That's pretty powerful stuff, folks. All their eyes could do was just get to the foot level. You know, it's interesting to note that for the Lord to stretch out his hand, we, and of course we don't see that, for the Lord to stretch out his hand would have meant death. And since man cannot see God and live, and of course we see that again in chapter 33, verse 20, yet in this verse, they saw the God of Israel and the Lord responded with mercy and acceptance rather than wrath. Now, verse 12 the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there and I will give you tablets of stone. This is the first time that we find the mention of what form that the revelation of the law was going to take and that was on tablets of stone. They were also called the tablets of the testimony and we find that in chapter 31 verse 18 and they were called the tablets of the covenant in Deuteronomy 9 verse 9. Uh, in verses 16 through 18, uh, but, but before we, we begin to, to, to really take a dive into them, let's read those three verses again, okay? This is 16, 17, and 18. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain for how long? 40 days and 40 nights. Okay. The verb that's translated rested here, okay? Verse 16, now the glory of the Lord rested, okay? The, the verb translated rested here in Hebrew is the word shekan, shekan. And it means, in Hebrew, it literally means to dwell. To dwell. The word tabernacle in Hebrew is the word mishkan, which it comes from the same root word, okay? And most of the remainder of this book is concerned, and it teaches us about the preparation of the tabernacle so that God could continue to dwell with his people in person, they're with them as they were uh, on the move through the wilderness instead of consistently on the mountain. Instead, of, he's going to leave the mountain and he's going to go with them. And so we have to really uh, gra grab that. These verses reveal the first of two 40-day trips back up, you know, back up to Sinai. We see the second trip over in chapter 34. 
uh, just think about this sight, this awe-inspiring sight of God's glory cloud, okay? Do we know the word that defines this word glory, God's glory? Do you know what that word is? I'm sure you do. It's the word Shekinah. The word is Shekinah. And here it is, this Shekinah glory. It's resting on the mountain, and it's there that Moses literally disappears into for 40 days and for 40 nights. And it impressed everyone with the singular importance of this event in all of Israel history. Can you imagine watching Moses go into that Shekinah glory cloud, not knowing what was going to happen and also not knowing how long he was going to be there. And imagine the look on the people's face when he comes out. Oh my. It was during this time, it was during these 40 days and 40 nights, that Moses received all of the instructions of the tabernacle that we're about to get into. So, while he's here, while he's in this Shekinah glory cloud, God is giving him all kinds of information, okay? The thing I want us to comprehend before we go further is that Moses remembered it all. God allowed Moses to mentally remember everything that he told him. Uh, all of the, the blueprints, how to make what out of what, the furnishings, how to, to build the furnishings out of what, and we'll, we're, again, we're about to get into that. The, the settling of the Shekinah upon the tabernacle at its completion, it impressed the Israelites with that single importance that this structure of, that, that, that is going to be made for worship and for their relationship with Yahweh. And you'll find that on over deeper in chapter 40, verses 34 through 38. Okay, when we get to chapter 25, okay? Chapter 25 is part of the conversation that God is going to give Moses. And it is legitimately the blueprints for this mobile tabernacle. All right, it is a massive complex, and you, we're going to see that. Now, uh, for those of you who understand building terms and blueprints, uh, and, and I know Johnny, I know you do, Larry Jones, I know you do, uh, and if there's anyone else out there, I'm not trying to cut you short, I just don't know who all is watching that is familiar with this, but you have a master blueprint plan. And there you see the overall picture. And then once you begin to turn the pages and you look at each section, then each section gets very, very specific with the minute details as to how to build that specific section. So, I mean, am I right? Is that Am I understanding it correctly? I don't know. When I've looked at blueprints for houses and blueprints for churches, that's what I've seen. You know, the first two or three pages is always the master, and that's the, the ultimate finished product. That's what's coming. But when you start to peel the, the pages back, then you start to see the, the intricacies of uh, what to put where in each of the rooms and or in the entire complex. And so what we're going to find early on uh, when Moses is about to reveal this starting in chapter 25 is we're going to see the master blueprint. Okay, this is the big picture and, and how it's going to be done. And then when you dive deeper into the next chapters, uh, the next five or six chapters, then it's going to be like we, we're opening the pages of the blueprint package and you're being able to see the things in a little bit more intricate detail. So let's... Uh, Let's just kind of make a mental note of that moving forward. So right now, God is giving Moses the master blueprint, and this is coming out to you and me. It's coming out to the children of Israel. Okay, verse 25. All right, here we go. We're going to look at, uh, we'll look at the first nine verses real quick. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but because I really want us to talk about it, and if you've got questions, you've got comments, make sure you get them in. I do understand there's about a 20-second lag time. I do get that. But this is a great opportunity to ask questions about the tabernacle, okay? Here we go. First nine verses, starting at chapter 25. Then the Lord said to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel 
that they bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them. You ready? Gold, silver, and bronze. Blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, ram's skin dyed red, badger skins, and we're going to talk about badger skins because it's not what you think. And a, 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 this is hard for me to say, acacia wood. It is acacia wood. Okay. Oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Okay, now we got the purpose, okay? Verse 9, according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. In other words, I want you to make it just like this. Do not deviate one little bit, okay? It's the master blueprint. All right, now let's kind of break this part. This very detailed and divinely given blueprint of the tabernacle removes any speculation whatsoever that it has any connection to or comparisons with or comparisons of all of those little bitty uh, false idols and teachings that they had back in Egypt, okay? And this is crushes that theory. It's just, it's just not there. And also, uh, it has uh, no connection to the little portable sanctuaries that, uh, that belong to some of those, uh, uh, those odd tribes that were there in, in the desert. So this is specifically given by God himself to Moses, to the children of Israel. It's not connected to anyone. It's not because of anyone. This is directly from God. The origin of the tabernacle was found in God and in God alone. And it was delivered to Moses by this special revelation. Okay, the conversation again is taking place on Mount Sinai. It's during this 40 day, 40 night window. Uh, the thing, let's understand, and I go back to the end of chapter 24, people looking up on the mountain while Moses is in there, the top of the mountain looks like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain. So that's what the people down at the foot of the mountain are seeing, all three, three and a half million people are. So that's all they're seeing. Okay, who's in this conversation? It's only God and it's only Moses. So that's where they are. Verse two says, bring me an offering. They bring me an offering voluntarily and freely. The people were given opportunity to personally contribute to the nation's worship center from the list of the 14 components and the materials that are needed to build. Now, we, uh, okay, for, what was the first things they needed? Gold, silver, and bronze. Okay, we have to wonder how much of this contribution, especially of those three items, came from their, their pillage, if you will, of the Egyptian homes before they were allowed to leave. If you remember, if you go back to the early chapters uh, in the book of Exodus, you, you know where they were given the opportunities to, to get all kinds of good stuff from the, from the Egyptians. Gold, silver, and bronze was critical in that, and so they definitely got it. But you th see, the thing is, is God made sure it happened because God had a purpose for it, and here's the purpose. This is a great teaching moment here because sometimes things happened back days, weeks, months ago, and we don't know why. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the purpose appears. And that's what happened to them because we know we're months away from the actual departure from Egypt. We already know that. We've talked about that. And so months ago, they were given the opportunity to take basically what they wanted from the Egyptians. They got all the good stuff, the gold, the silver, the bronze, and we're going to see the rest of the thread, the, the linens, all that good stuff. They took it. Well, why in the world? Okay, I mean, for real. I mean, how, where are you going to spend that money because you're, you're a, a no-bad group? You're out here roaming around the country. Was it to make you rich? Was it to set up a city? Okay, nobody knew the answer, but they had it in hand. And so now that here we are months later and all of a sudden, whoa, the opportunity comes. And this is what God is asking for. Now then I've given it to you. You give it back to me for an offering. And this is where it comes from. So uh, we know that uh, they've got it. We know it's coming. The people responded so 
much so with joy and enthusiasm that they finally had to be restrained from, from bringing as much back. But they literally had to say, stop bringing stuff. We've got what we need. Thank you. We've got what we need. And we'll see some of that over chapter 35 and in 36, where there, there literally had to be a, a stoppage, if you will. A similar response occurred centuries later when King David uh, requested gifts to build the temple. And we'd see that in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, first nine verses. Okay, here's the offering. Gold, silver, bronze. Okay, now let's, let's break it apart. Then blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Okay. Blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Okay, let's understand that while the men that were slaves, the Israelite men that were slaves, they were doing most of the building projects for the Egyptians. The women were also slaves, and they were working in the homes, in the tapestries, and they were doing things for the Egyptian women. And, and if you just search out history, you know that the Egyptians had lavish clothing. I mean, I mean, they had the finest attire anywhere, and it was so bright, it was so colorful, so vivid. Okay, here we have this 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 image that God is is requiring this as part of His offering, which is the blue, purple, and the scarlet thread. Okay, the Israelite women knew how to make this stuff for the Egyptians, and so this was no nothing new to them. You know, I, we need we need blue thread. Okay, no problem. We'll take care of it. We need purple or, or whatever. They knew how to do it. And plus, they might have even got some of the stuff in that pillage along with that gold, silver, and bronze. Again, we just don't know. But they were crafted to the point to where making it was, was not a problem. How did they get the colors? Okay, how did they get the colors? Interesting thought here. And, and, and I've got this information for you. For you note takers, y'all have got to be having a blast with this. The blue colors, the blue thread was made by, uh, they, they had to dye the thread, uh, obviously, and it came, the blue came from a shellfish. There was a certain shellfish in that region that gave them the blue color. So they dyed thread uh, with this shellfish, parts of that shellfish, and it got blue. The purple came from secretions of what is called a murex snail. Don't ask me how they got the secretions. I don't want to know, but that's how they got it, and because of that item in the dye, it turned the thread purple. The scarlet, okay, you're gonna love this. The scarlet color came from powdered eggs and bodies of certain worms that attached themselves to holly plants. And the Israelite women knew that and they would gather these worms and these eggs and they would crush them and they put them in the dye and that would turn the thread red. And so now then you have blue, purple, and red thread. Uh, in order to produce that, though, I mean, you just think about that. In order to produce that, to get that consistency of that, all the same blues are alike, the purples are alike, the, the scarlets are alike, and especially from the different natural resources, it demonstrated a substantial degree of, of technical sophistication when you just really process this. So, so these women knew what they were doing, and it was no big deal to them. They got it taken care of. Next thing that uh, the offering that God asked for was fine linen. Again, as I've just said, Egypt had a, a reputation for uh, excellence in producing finely uh, fine linen, and, and this is where it comes from. The linen is made from these dyed threads. So all of this is now uh, in, interwoven, and you're probably thinking, okay, what in the world are we doing? God's asking for gold, silver, bronze, and now then this different color threads, and now fine linen, what's he doing? Boy, were they about to find out. What else do they want? Goat's hair. Goat's hair. Then ram skins dyed red. So they had to, uh, they, they had to, dye the skin of the rams. They had to dye it red. And then badger skins. Now, uh, we would think badger as, as uh, you know, one of these little critters that's out here, uh, uh, you know, roam around in woods. And I don't know a whole lot about, about uh, you know, outdoorsy stuff. I don't know where badgers live, and some of you hunters probably do. But you would think that. But what we're looking at, this is the skin of a fish, okay? Uh, and most specifically, this is most probably the skin of dolphins that was coming out of the Mediterranean Sea. So just 
something to think about. At least that's what most theologians are telling us, and I just want to throw that out there. Uh, that's not gym theology, so I'm just I'm throwing that out there as to what that I have found in my studies as to what it means. And it makes sense when you realize what they're going to do with it, that it would come from the skin of a fish like a dolphin. It would just, it would just uh, make, make better sense. Uh, the tan skins with all the wool removed and then dyed resembled what you and I would know as Moroccan leather. So very high quality leather goods that's, that's taking place. And then here's the wood. It's acacia wood. That's how it's pronounced. A-C-A-C-I-A. Acacia wood. It's a hard, durable, closed grained, and an aromatic wood there found in the desert. And it is avoided by wood eating insects. And it's, it's considered good for cabinet making. And it was found in large quantities in the Sinai Peninsula. So that's the wood that they're going to need. They needed oil for the lights, they needed spices for the anointing oil. You know, they're, they're about to make it and for the sweet incense, and then onyx stones. Okay, when we talk about the onyx stones, this is sometimes thought to be what we call chrysophrase quartz. Chrysophrase quartz, which is a product known to the Egyptians and with, with Israel, though, and there, there's no doubt. Uh, it's seriously thought to be the stone beryl, B-E-R-Y-L, beryl. Uh, and then they wanted the stones to be set in the ephod and the breastplate, and that's all coming in the future. We'll talk about that soon when we get there. Each of these items plays a critical part in the construction of the tabernacle and in the furniture that goes in the tabernacle. Uh, verse 8, let me get back over to it. And let them make me a sanctuary. Make who? Me. Me a sanctuary. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? Dwell among them. Okay. God's intention was to dwell among his people. We need to understand that. That's God's intention. His intention is to dwell among his people. This is the reason that Moses was given these plans. Obedience to God's plan was critical. It had to happen, and it had to happen exactly like God is telling Moses. Because of that, it is assured that some significance is to be found in the pattern. Now, what I want to do, and let me check my time. Oh, I still go a little bit. I want to talk briefly, uh, and this is the overview, about the furniture of the tabernacle. Now, when we start at verse 10 through verse 22... Uh, is is the first piece of the furniture. And let me just give you the list of the furniture that's going to be in the tabernacle, okay? Uh, again, here's your for you note takers, here it is. There's six pieces that were to be built. They were to be constructed from these offerings that we've just talked about. Here's the first one. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. Now, uh, something something to 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 realize is that we are getting the instructions of furniture that is starting from the inside, the, the, the deepest part of the tabernacle to the outside, okay? They are in order. When you, when you look at the blueprint of the tabernacle, then you will see that the Ark of the Covenant is in the deepest part. It is the holiest of holies in that area itself. And so every piece that we have takes one step out. The Ark of the Covenant is first. Second piece is called the Table of Showbread. The Table of Showbread. Next is the Golden Lampstand, or what we will call the Menorah. The Menorah. Then there's the Altar of Burnt Offering. The Altar of Burnt Offering. Then the Bronze Laver. That's L-A-V-E-R. The Bronze Laver. And then the Altar of Incense. The altar of incense. Okay, real quick, all of them together. Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, the golden lampstand or the menorah, the altar of burnt offering, the bronze labor, and the altar of incense. So there's six, six pieces of furniture that are going to go in the tabernacle that are going to be handmade by the Israelite craftsmen. So here we go. Uh, again, can't miss this. you got, got to understand it. They are coming from the inside all the way out. Uh, the thing that we also have to realize is that this whole thing that they are about to build, the tabernacle, the furniture, everything, has got to be mobile because this is a nomadic 
group of people that is on the move in the wilderness. And so it has to be able to pack up and go and to set back up in its completeness uh, without question. In other words, you're not going to deviate and take the piece that was here and put it over here or vice versa. Everything has to be set up identical the way it is originally planned wherever they are. So Again, some uh, some degree of difficulty, really, if you just want to know the truth. And when you when you break into the, the the size of this this tabernacle, you're going to understand exactly what all is going on. Now, what I want to do is we're going to look first at the Ark of the Covenant, and we're going to pick up reading at verse ten. Uh, yeah, do you like this stuff? I mean, is this is this good stuff? Uh, have you had a chance to study it? Uh, in the past? Are you familiar with it? Uh, I'd really like to know where you are in your studies of this. Is it new to you? Uh, is it boring to you? You know, so on and so forth. So go ahead and hit me up while I start reading this and uh, kind of let me know where you are in your uh, background of the, of the tabernacle. All right, here we go. Verse 10. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it, and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of Akisha wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark and they shall not be taken from it. So we're basically going to build this, this cabinet, okay? And we're going to talk about the, the dimensions here in a little bit. And it's going to be overlaid inside and outside with gold. They're going to work this, this gold product that's that's been given to it. And then at the four corners, they're going to mold rings of gold. And they are going to take acacia wood. They're going to make poles of acacia wood. They're going to overlay those things with the... Uh, with gold, and they are going to slide them through the rings so that you could have four men to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Literally, they would put the poles on their shoulder, and there would be four that would go forth. And I find it very interesting that the poles are not to be taken out of the of, of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, do we know why? Mm, we might find out later, but it's it's really it's a moot point. But I just I just thought that interesting to me. Okay, they shall not be taken from it. Verse sixteen, and you shall put into the ark. Oh, okay. Now we're being told what to put in the ark. The testimony which I will give you. Okay. Okay. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Now this is basically the lid to this thing. Okay. It's called the mercy seat. You shall, <clears throat> excuse me, you shall make a mercy seat of what? Pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and the cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. In other words, you're not going to make two of these cherubim and then attach it. It's all going to be one piece, okay? And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And I will, what? I will meet you there, or I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Here it is. This is the, the master blueprint for the ark of the covenant. It's also called the ark of the testimony. All right. The ark of the testimony. Let's see. Denny, done Bible studies that went into detail on the tabernacle. Excellent, Miss Danny, and love your input as we get through this. So you go ahead and jump in at any time. Pam, very interesting. I've studied it, but I always love learning something new. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, and I don't want to make this boring because we can get lost into the boring details of how to build what. And I don't want to do that because every nickel and dime piece of this thing is, is important. 
because God said, do it like this. And, and we have to understand that if God said it, there's an important to us, right? And so we, we got to understand this. Okay, the, the Ark of the Covenant is, is comprised of two components. Number one, the Ark itself. We saw that verses 10 through 16. And then the lid, the mercy seat in verses 17 through 22. This is it. This is the key piece of the tabernacle. It is the most sacred part of the tabernacle. The Ark itself, as I said, is like a box. It's a, uh, uh, it's a container type portion, okay? It's going to hold things. And so we need to understand the value of this container, this Ark of the Covenant. Now look at the details, okay? Here's the, here's the, uh, uh, the blueprint, okay? Let's kind of go over it. It's made of a quiche wood. We've already talked about that. It's two and a half cubits in length, one and a half cubits wide, one and a half cubits tall. Now if a cubit, which we know is approximately 18 inches in length, that means that the Ark is 45 inches by 27 by 27. Okay, 45, almost four feet by just over two feet by just over two feet. All right, 45 by 27 by 27. It's overlaid, the other one says acacia wood is overlaid with pure gold inside and out and gold moldings all around. This is craftsmanship at its finest. These, these people from Israel were used to doing this for the, for the Egyptians. And so now that they are getting to do it for Yahweh. What an honor it must have felt like for these men in order to build these pieces of furniture. It's overlaid with gold inside and out, and gold moldings all around, four gold rings, and just like I mentioned, one on each corner, excuse me, one on each corner. Poles were made of acacia wood, they're overlaid with gold, they're to be placed through the gold rings for carrying purposes and not to be taken out. Verse 16. Uh, we read this, and you shall put into the Ark of the Covenant the testimony, let me get back over there to it, the Ark of the Testimony, which I will give you. So in other words, we have to understand it's not here yet. What I'm going to give you is not here. But there's something coming that you're going to put in this container box into the Ark of the Covenant. God repeats these words in verse 21. Let's, uh, let's roll on down there. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. So he's repeated himself now in, in like, like five verses. He's, he's already repeated himself. We do not see the testimony in Scripture. We do not get our hands on it until chapter 34, verse 29. So we are now in chapter 25, and we're literally, we're nine chapters away from getting this, and there's an awful lot of things that's going to take place in nine chapters. So let's just be mindful as to where we are and what's coming. Uh, so the Ark of the Cabinet, this is the box, the container box, it is it is empty. Now we get, uh, let's see, never boring. The gold made it so heavy, four men to carry. Exactly. This box had to be astronomically heavy. You know, it's almost four feet by two feet by two feet. Oh, well, just over two feet. So... If this thing's overlaid with solid gold and the rings are gold and plus the mercy seat that we're about to describe and it's all of pure gold, this thing had to weigh a doggone ton. And so, uh, man, can, mm, can you just imagine though the task of four men? You, 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 and you, you're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Think about that. Okay, the mercy seat. It's two and a half cubits long by one and a half cubits wide. So basically it's 45 inches, okay, by 27. Okay, that's the top to it. All of pure gold. It's exactly the top dimensions of the ark. On the top of the mercy seat on the lid are two cherubim that are hammered out of gold. And they are one with the mercy seat. So there's not going to be pieces. Like I said, in other words, well, here we are, and we're going to add this, and ping, 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 we're going to add this, and same thing over here. No, 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 no. This is all hand carved out into one piece. I would really be interested to know how much the weight of the mercy seat was, how much it weighed. Now, you just think about that. That's 45 inches by 27 inches with those cherubim on top of it. And we don't really know how big they were either of solid gold. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. The cherubim shall face each other. Their wings shall stretch out above 
covering the mercy seat with their wings, basically forming an arch. Cherubim, uh, just historically, are associated with the majestic glory and presence of God. And we see that in Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 1 through 22. That's Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 1 through 22. In 1 Samuel 4, 4, and in Isaiah 37, 16, Scripture reveals the cherubim as the bearers of God's throne. Uh, in Genesis 3.24, they are the guardians of the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life. And on the mercy seat, uh, it is going to be put on top of the ark. So the cherubim play a pretty substantial part uh, in the Old Testament. And, and uh, wouldn't it be neat to go ahead and do a study on the cherubim? just to see who, what, and where. So yeah, that might be something we want to uh, we want to take a look at. Then God says that he will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the Ark of the, uh, Ark of the Testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So now God is going to do his talking here and not on Mount Sinai. Okay, we're going to uh, kind of throw the brakes on right there and uh, we will pick up next Wednesday night uh, looking at the next piece of furniture, which is the table for the showbread. The table for the showbread. I would encourage you to go ahead and to uh, take a look at that next passage of scripture and just kind of read through uh, all of chapter 25 as we begin to move forward. And that way, if you've got questions or comments, you can have them ready to go. And uh, we will be glad to get them out here and chew on them as a group tonight. I hope you have had a wonderful night. This has uh, always been impressive to me to be able to picture what's going on here and uh, you know God uh, with Moses on the mountain and he comes back and this is instructions that he has and the children of Israel just kind of go crazy and they start making all this stuff and uh, to have been a fly on the wall to have watched it all uh, it's a humbling experience when you think about it I mean it just really 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 is okay uh, tomorrow I'll see you guys in the morning uh, somewhere around that 8:30 time slot 30 to 9 for our coffee chat we are in first Timothy well, guys, you do not want to miss this. This is some deep, deep stuff. And we have already spent a couple days in chapter one, and we have been smacked around already for two days from Paul as he's talking to Timothy and the things that we can do to make better, to be to be better, and uh, things that we need to look at, things that we need to change. So join me tomorrow as we crack open chapter two. Uh, Miss Pat, again, be off the next two weeks. Johnny uh, is going to be taking off for the next couple of weeks as well till we take a look at this heat thing and uh, see what all is taking place. So Sunday morning. Do not miss Sunday morning. It is going to be so wonderful. We're going to go deeper into our series on the neighbor as we begin now looking at those last two commandments that are tied to this, this uh, uh, second greatest commandment. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to spending some time there. And then immediately following the morning service, we will have our quarterly business meeting. And so I want to make sure that you are aware of that. And uh, that'll be taking place again right after the Sunday morning service. Folks, that is all I've got. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. There's one more thing. Uh, Gloria is going to be out of the office tomorrow. Uh, and so if you need anything, make sure that you call me and I will be glad to get it all taken care of for you. I'm still working from home and uh, getting things done here. And uh, if you need anything, make sure you call me. You can send me a message, send me a text, uh, whatever you need to, to do. I will be glad to get it and get you taken care of. Uh, Miss Mary Whittington. Do not sleep in the heat tonight, okay? You got lots of offers already on, on uh, online tonight for uh, a place to sleep where it's cooler. So uh, get where it's cool, okay? Uh, don't, just just do it, okay? Just just go do it. Uh, that'd be the smartest thing in the world. Uh, keep the folks that we hadn't mentioned on our prayer list uh, on your prayer list for the rest of the week. Uh, pray for somebody to come into your path that you can share Jesus with, Okay? That's what it's all about. Folks, I love you guys so very much. Thank you for loving me, for loving my family. Thank you for your prayers for Miss Denise. She is doing considerable better. Uh, well, she was on Zoom last night, and she's been on tonight. 
And so uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to see her strength begin to come back. It's a long road. But uh, we know that God is in control and we are trying not to get in a hurry and uh, not to uh, jump the gun on where God is and what he's wanting to do. But uh, uh, in the meantime, I will see you guys in person on Sunday morning online or on campus. And I'll see you tomorrow morning in the book of 1 Timothy. Good night, everybody. I love you guys so very much. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.